Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Imagination Nature. August and September has been a very busy month for me, and for everyone else I'm sure. For that reason, I didn't have time to prepare a local wildlife species episode. Instead, I'd like to show you a little special I put together. Before my wife and Annie and I moved back to my hometown, we were living in Tetonia, Idaho. We were right below the Grand Tetons and we were an hour south of Yellowstone National Park. We were also about a 30 minute drive over the Teton Pass into Wyoming from the Grand Teton National Park. So we had a lot of opportunity to visit the Northwest, some wonderful, wonderful places, and I want to share that with you now. So please sit back and enjoy this very special episode. It's not a local episode, but it's something I really wanted to share with you all. Thank you very much. Come on, let's check it out together. Let me first show you the area that I'm going to be talking about. The area is known as the Teton Valley, which actually is split into two Teton Valleys, one on the Wyoming side and one on the Idaho side. The split is the Teton Range, the still moving mountain range that is the top end of the Rocky Mountains. The famous Grand Tetons hosts a beautiful national park to the east, while on the west side of Idaho, it plays host to a beautiful and isolated valley in between the Teton Range and Idaho Falls. It's a beautiful valley, although it harbors eight months of winter and then four months of the most beautiful country you'll ever see in your life. To me, absolutely worth the eight months of pure, frigid cold. Due to the cold temperatures, you can understand that the wildlife in this area are survivors. It's a very, very beautiful place, rich in history as well as wildlife and beauty beyond compare. Yellowstone lies within three states. The majority is in Wyoming, but it does cut into a sliver of Idaho and a nice portion above in Montana. What lies within Yellowstone is nothing short of a geological wonderland. And that goes with the surrounding areas and the entire Teton Range. Remember, Yellowstone lies within a caldera, a giant, huge, still active volcano. The circle area that's the target of this episode goes from the Teton Valley of Idaho, north to west Yellowstone, east to Godner, Montana, south down through Yellowstone into Grand Teton National Park, and down to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, back west over the Teton Pass, back into the Teton Valley of Idaho. This is the area I'm gonna focus on with this wildlife episode of life below the Tetons. Let's start with the grizzly bear. The grizzly bear, meaning grizzled, that being golden or gray tint. Not to be confused with the word grizzly, meaning horrible or horrid or frightening. Great big grizzly bear. Well, the bear got down, looked ready to charge. The preacher never seen another quite that large. They looked each other right smack in the eye. Didn't take that preacher long to say bye. In 1815, when famed American ornithologist and naturalist George Ord classified the California grizzly, not for its hair, but rather for its character, it was called Ursus horribilis. The grizzly bear is any North American subspecies of brown bear including the Kodiak bear, the Alaskan brown, peninsular, even the recently extinct California grizzly, in which Ord made his first classification. Ord was a bit of an authority, 
After all, he was the person who received both the grizzly bear and pronghorn antelope for description by none other than Lewis and Clark. A female grizzly bear runs between 290 and 440 pounds. A male between 400 and 700 pounds. Actually, a coastal bear was weighed in at 900 pounds. Then there's the captive grizzly that weighed a whopping 1,500 pounds. That's half a ton, folks. That bear stood almost 10 feet and lived to be 44 years old. The longest captive grizzly lifespan ever recorded. The lifespan of a grizzly bear is roughly 22 years for a male, 26 for a female. The difference is the male uh, has a much more dangerous life, especially when it comes to mating and they have to uh, uh, fight off other large males. There are 1,500 grizzly bears left in the lower 48 states. 800 of those can be found in Montana. 600 can be found in the Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Park areas. Another 70 to 100 are in eastern Idaho, which is where Dee, myself, and Annie lived. So as you can see, the numbers are, are, are low enough to continue to have a concern. These are beautiful animals. Once they're gone, they're gone forever. So it's very important that we continue to, to conserve and, and be aware uh, of our environment for, for not only the sake of human life, but for the sake of wildlife. And this is uh, for good reason. We, we would love our, our, our children and our children's children and all the generations to come to be able to enjoy the wildlife that we're so fortunate to have sharing this great earth with us. How about we tell them about your, your ancestor? <laughs> is, is that what we're gonna do? Okay, well, while, while Annie takes a little breather, uh, let's talk about her great ancestor, the wolf, the gray wolf in particular, or the timber wolf. walking in these woods. Wife's little red riding hood. Hey there, little red riding hood. You sure are looking good. You're everything a big bad wolf could want. Gray wolves range in color from grizzled gray or black to all white. They are the domestic dog's ancestors. Although they were once almost hunted to extinction in the 1930s in the lower 48 states, today wolves have returned to the Great Lakes, Northern Rockies, and Southwestern United States. Wolves eat ungulates, or large hoofed mammals, deer, elk, buffalo, moose, they will also eat beaver and rabbit and raccoon and small prey. They are also scavengers and will eat any kind of dead animal that's died from other causes. There's an estimated 3,700 gray wolves in the Great Lake region, about 1,650 in the northern Rockies. They hunt in packs of seven to eight. Each pack has an alpha male and an alpha female, which usually mate for life. A wolf's howl is like a fingerprint. Each one is unique, so other pack members can tell them apart from each other. Breeding occurs once a year, usually between late January and somewhere in March. Litter size is four to seven pups. They're born blind and defenseless. They stay with mama until about 10 months when they're able to 
uh, scavenge and, and find food and protect themselves uh, as, as young adults. The lifespan of a gray wolf is seven to eight years in the wild. In protected areas or sheltered areas, they have been known to live to 12 years. Thanks to the reintroduction of wolves at Yellowstone National Park in 1995, it remains the best place to view and hear wolves in their natural habitat. It's great and one of the main reasons to go there if you haven't been there already. Okay, easy. Easy does it. Oh, there's another one. Wow. Okay. You're good. And you remember the foxes that I showed you out here in East Hampton? Well, they got some beautiful foxes too. Ladies and gentlemen, the birds here in the Northwest are just as beautiful as the land mammals. There's just so many beautiful varieties, whether it's waterfowl, songbirds, 
shorebirds, any, any type of birds, as well as accipiters and other hawks and, and birds of prey. My favorite that I filmed over the years I spent were the bald eagle. And it's so nice to know that the bald eagle has made it over on Shelter Island and is starting to populate. This is a wonderful thing. I've seen them uh, upstate New York years ago. I've been seeing them in Wisconsin for many years. And of course, in the Northwest, they're, they're so abundant. In fact, um, it's a shame because uh, you could you could actually see quite a few of them at, at the landfills and, and, and the dumps in that area um, as uh, it's just a, a, a way of, of easy way of finding food and out there in the Northwest when you have uh, such heavy thick snow cover um, finding food is priority and, and sometimes priority shouldn't be confused with uh, possible these are animals of survival they've withstood the test of time they continue to withstand all the odds stacked against them and that's why they survive to this day unfortunately technology and industry is a burden uh, that wildlife are, are find it difficult to evolve past and for this we have to be extra careful and extra aware of all the species here at home, um, around the country, and most definitely around the world.
I hope you all enjoyed the episode of the Wildlife of the Northwest. I had a lot of fun filming it. When you're out there in the field filming wildlife, you never know what you're going to run into, but you always want to keep that camera rolling because of that. Meanwhile, we had just uh, finished having our wonderful event and concert, uh, the first annual Gansett Trash Bash in Amagansett at Miss Amelia's Cottage Grounds and it was a complete success. We had a wonderful time. We spread the message of a trash free existence here in East Hampton Town to many people and we had a lot of support and my thanks to everyone, all the musicians and the businesses and everyone who got involved and all the media that helped publicize, especially LTV who uh, played my promos and I'm very appreciated to them and what they do for our community. I now want to continue with my series of trash talk. So please everyone, let's continue to spread the message about having a trash free town here. And remember, if you see trash on the ground, we do not ignore it, we pick it up. If we have trash, we hold on to it until we get to a proper receptacle. If the receptacle's full, we keep it until we get to one that isn't. It's that simple, folks. We can do this, we're gonna do it. So now, please listen as we talk some trash. Thank you, and we'll see you in the next episode of Imagination Nature. Bye now. they 
done to my soul Look what they done to my soul Well they tied it up in a plastic bag Turned it upside down Look what they done to my soul Look what they done